um, all of you for coming. Um, as Sarah mentioned, I'm Jamie Van Ostrand. I'm the new associate professor at the WVU College of Law. I started there in July, and we just opened a center for energy and sustainable development, which I'm heading up in addition to teaching energy law and environmental law. And the thing I want to talk about today is integrated resource planning. I think as Sarah mentioned, I've, I've got a pretty long background in, in utility regulation. I um, actually grew up as the son of a utility regulator. My father was chairman of the Iowa Commerce Commission for eight years, so I grew up sort of hearing all about the utility business, utility regulation business. After I got out of law school, I spent five years with the New York Public Service Commission learning utility regulation business at a highly respected uh, regulatory agency. And then I went and moved to the Northwest and practiced law for 22 years with large law firms in the Northwest, and primarily representing investor-owned utilities in great proceedings in front of public utility commissions. So then uh, about four years ago, I transitioned into teaching and moved to the West Virginia University College of Law last um, July. So uh, what I'm talking about today is about sort of integrated resource planning, which I became involved in back in the Northwest in, in 1989. I think California, Oregon, and Washington were some of the early states to begin uh, implementing what was then called least cost planning, but is more commonly known today as integrated resource planning. I just want to talk briefly about, about the elements. Um, but it's basically this process of a utility taking a long, it's a long-term planning exercise where you look at your utility loads, what you expect your customer loads to be, taking into account energy efficiency, but and, you know, looking at projections of load growth, of population growth in your service territory, what are the economic trends, but you come up with your, with your load forecast, um, and then you want to look at your existing and planned resources. Basically, what resources does the utility have in its resource base? Its gas plants, its hydro plants, its coal plants, its nuclear plants, and and basically then comparing those loads, the, the amount of electricity you need to produce to satisfy your customer demands with what you know the resources you have available to meet those demands, typically that will result in a supply gap. You've got some sort of deficiency that you're going to need to meet and then at least cost planning or integrated resource planning process is what are the options for meeting that supply gap. And this is a, this is a from a former client of mine, Puget Sound Energy, this is their most recent integrated resource plan. So those, those upward sloping curves on the right, those are their projected load. Typically you do it over a 20 year period. And a, a key aspect of integrated resource planning is you look at scenarios. So you'll see uh, three slopes to that line. So they'll have different scenarios of what they anticipate their demand, or what the demands are going to be based on population trends, economic trends. They'll have a low growth, medium growth, high growth scenarios. So the upper lines across the top are pretty much their loads. How much, how much uh, electricity are their customers going to need? The lines on the, the bottom are pretty much the evaluation of their existing resources. That would, be, that would take into account their coal plants, their uh, hydro plants, their natural gas fire plants, renewables, Puget Sound has some, a bunch of wind and solar, and you'll see those kind of stepping down as plants retire, they have a lot of contracts in Wind Columbia, hydro resources, those contracts are expiring, so we can see their resource stack over that period is declining, and then that gap between the line, the upper sloping line and the downward sloping um, resource portfolio, that represents the supply gap, that is the integrated resource planning process. What what tools does the utility have available to meet that supply gap? And what integrated resource planning does is you evaluate your supply side and your demand side options using a consistent method for calculating cost effectiveness. And if you think back at the slide that Mike Harmon just showed, which showed the relative cost of energy efficiency versus the relative cost of the generating resources, and then you've got the whole range of the integrated resource options, just as in Mike's slide, you've got simple cycle combustion turbines, you've got hydro, you've got coal, you've got nuclear at the very top, you've got solar photovoltaic, but those are all the range of options that the utility has available for meeting that supply gap. And the integrated part of integrated resource planning is let's put demand side, energy efficiency and conservation on the same consistent method for calculating cost effectiveness as we look at on the supply side. We're going to pay as much to require energy efficiency or encourage customers to conserve 
to conserve as we would pay to build a natural gas fire plant or to build a coal plant or to invest in renewables or to invest in hydro. So integrated resource planning is, is really this process of identifying that supply gap, putting all the options available to the utility on a consistent basis on a level playing field, supply side and demand side, and you figure out what is the what is the least cost means of meeting that supply gap, the long-term lowest cost for customers. And it's typically a present value revenue requirement which sort of recognizes that some resources you have higher up from the capital costs, but you may have lower operating costs, and the way you put that on a common, uh, common basis is to sort of present value of everything back, so you look at what the costs are of those resources over a longer term. And a big aspect of, of integrated resource planning, which you saw with those three different, those three different um, curves in terms of the load forecasts, are the various scenarios, because I think another thing that Mike mentioned is the fact that coal prices have doubled over the last 10 years. Why coal is an international commodity. Our rate payers in this state are bearing the consequences of coal becoming an international commodity. And that needs to be taken into account by utilities when we, when we take a, a look at integrated resource planning. We should be looking at different price scenarios for the various resource options. We should have a low coal price scenario, a medium coal price scenario, and a high coal price scenario. And we should look at, and it's a very sophisticated modeling process because you want a portfolio of resources that's going to be in the best long-term interest of customers to help customers keep their utility rates down. This is a this is a basic exercise in utility management to help customers keep their rates down by looking at these various options. Because I think if we look, to look back 10 years ago, maybe we couldn't have anticipated that coal was going to be an international commodity. Prices were double in 10 years. But if there were, if there were a scenario in a 2001 integrated resource plan from Appalachian Power, it might have shown that it's not a very prudent course of action to be so heavily reliant upon coal. We should have been looking at other resource options, perhaps, I think, looking at Mike's slide for how cost-effective energy efficiency is, making energy efficiency a bigger part of the utility's resource portfolio. But it's the, it's the process of very sophisticated modeling to look at these various scenarios, figure out what is, in the, what is the best long-term plan for customers in terms of keeping their rates down. And, and typically, the, the process is I'm familiar with, it's, it's a 20-year process. Um, so you're looking at your demands, you're looking at your, at your resources over a 20-year period. And then typically, an integrated resource plan is done every couple of years. And so you take that long-term plan and you identify a short-term action plan. What are we going to do in the next two years to implement this longer-term term plan? And then every couple of years, you kick out another integrated resource plan. And then you, you, may, you probably have to reevaluate the assumptions you made from the last one. You look at what are the steps that you've taken that you've taken to implement the last IRP. Another another piece of it. Integrated resource planning has, has practiced by a number of states is this public involvement process that there's utility stakeholder groups and there's utilities sort of sharing their their strategies. Here's here's what we're looking at. Here's why we prefer this resource over another. So you get customer, industrial customer groups are involved, the environmental groups are involved, the, the low income rate payer advocate groups are involved, the commission staff is involved. But you've got this exchange, so it's not just this adversarial process where a commission or utility comes in and asks for a rate increase to cover the cost of a plant. It's this, all the stakeholders would have been involved in this process because of this public involvement in the, in the planning process. And then in turn, if you have this rigorous IRP process, then if the utility goes out and they do what the IRP process says they do, then they've gone a long way towards establishing the prudence of that particular resource acquisition. We went through this process, we did all this sophisticated modeling, we had all this stakeholder involvement, we all agreed that the next, that the best option for us to meet the supply gap was partly through energy efficiency, partly through a combined cycle combustion turbine. Now we're going to go out and we're going to go down that course of action and the utility comes in for a rate case to start recovering those costs of rates. Pretty much all the stakeholders got to say, yeah, we were involved in that process. You did what you said you were going to do and it's pretty hard, um, pretty hard, uh, a big assignment to sort of second guess the prudence of the utility's actions. So it's, for the utilities, it provides some certainty of the process. They know if they've got this involvement in the stakeholders, that when they do what they say they're going to do through the IRP process, 
that the chances are pretty good they're going to be recovering those those costs of meeting that resource need in red. So that's kind of the way it all it all ties together. Um, and this this is sort of what I would see as, as, as sort of the advantages in terms of you're looking at a portfolio of options under a variety of scenarios, and then it's going to produce that lowest long run revenue requirement for customers and I think for the energy efficiency piece. It really does determine how much does it make sense for us to pay for energy efficiency or conservation given the, the supply side of the source that we're going to be able to avoid by not having to build additional generation. And this is just my contact information. Again, public on the WBU College of Law website, um, but this is uh, my contact information at the College of Law, and I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you.